going to be talking about reply speeches. Reply speeches are a crucial element of the uh, World Schools format. They're something that people, a lot of the times, don't really get, don't really put into practice, like they should be put into practice. And they actually are really important, even though it's very hard to pinpoint where that relevance actually lies. How does the reply speech uh, influence the debate? So, what I want to talk to you about today are a number of things. The first thing is, how do reply speeches matter? How do they influence the debate? In what way do they create a difference in terms of what will be assessed in the debate? In terms of what the judge perceives in the debate? Secondly, we're going to talk about how, what, what, what is expected of reply speeches. What is expected of the debater that's going to stand up and deliver the reply speech. And thirdly, we're also going to talk about how can we put that into practice? What can we do? What types of techniques can we use for reply speeches? What we really shouldn't do? What really would be bad for reply speeches? And what would be really good or acceptable uh, in delivering reply speeches? Okay, so the first thing, what is the point of them? How do they influence the debate? Because there's a lot of, there, there is an impression that a lot of people have, I don't know if you share this impression, that look, the debate is going on with free constructive speeches, arguments are being presented, rebuttal is being presented, and then comes a four minute speech in which people just, you know, like sort of repeat the <coughs> arguments, sort of summarize the debate, that really is not going to bear an influence. I mean, if the debate's being won by one team throughout the rest of the debate, how can the reply speech possibly make a difference? I think this is a perception that people have. And, so, and because of this perception, the end result a lot of the times is, well, simply put, you know, I'm just going to summarize the debate, just going to emphasize the good points my team made, the bad points the other team made, and at the end of the day, you know, it's going to stay the same. This is a very faulty perception. Why? Because the way a judge has to perceive the debate is not viewing, uh, you know, the arguments as a as a blank sort of accumulation of this has been said, this has been said on one side, this has been said on the other side, let's see who's right. The whole point of assessing who won a debate is assessing which of the teams was a better advocate of the position they had to advocate for, for or against a particular motion. And within that context, what we see is that what happens a lot of the times in the constructive speeches, and it's very hard to avoid, is that there is a lot of analysis, there are a lot of examples, there's a lot of argumentation on different types of issues. But a lot of the times, what happens is, is that this isn't really put into perspective, or perspective is lost somehow. There is so much stuff that you're following as a judge when you're listening to the whole debate, and you have to decide if the teams have not already made it abundantly clear, which is like most of the times, what are the most important things in the debate? What are the things that are truly crucial to the position of each, each team? And what are the things that are not so crucial or are secondary? Right? So, the sort of work you have to do as, let's say, a first speaker in clarifying what your stance is, in clarifying what your position in the debate is, what your main, what your main uh, contentions are, what your main values that you're sustaining are, this is stuff that gets lost along the way in the debate, or stuff that gets put out of perspective. At the end of the debate, that's what you're expecting as a judge, that the debate is being put into perspective, that someone takes all that you know, mass of matter that's been coming out in all the speeches, all that analysis, all those examples, all that rebuttal, all that, all, all that refutation, and makes sense of it makes sense of it, puts it into perspective, into telling you what this whole discussion has been about. What are the conclusions that you as a judge should be looking after? What are the main contentions? And that's basically the role of the reply speaker. 
That's what the judge would be expecting. A clarification of what has been happening throughout the debate. Again, there might be a question here. But, you know, yeah, obviously, the judge expects a clarification from the reply speaker. But hasn't the judge really been paying attention? And therefore, you know, he has quite a good idea what the important points are, and he's probably also smarter than the debaters, right? So he knows what the important points are. Um, simple answer to this would be no, that's not the case. In simply following what's going on in a debate, like people will miss things, will miss, will miss things or will miss the proportion in which you care as a, as a team, the proportion in which you care or you accord importance to certain arguments. Right? This happens for two reasons. It happens firstly because simply <coughs> as a human being it's very hard to have to like understand and perceive a hundred percent of the content someone's throwing at you in a speech. That's simply scientifically proven that that doesn't happen. So you have to assume that that won't happen even when you're being judged. And secondly because a lot of the times even though in your head it was pretty clear what you want to say and what is the importance of each thing, in your speech, it might not become so clear. And especially when you're interacting with other arguments, it's easy to get derailed by answering to other points from the other side that weren't so important or weren't part of your initial strategy. So you might create some sort of impression that's different from what you were intending the first time. So that's why it is important from the get-go to re-clarify things for the judge, to re-put things in. Not to mention that, even if all those things aren't lost per se, you still need to have, you still need to remind things. It's always a good idea to remind things. Because at that point, when the judge is listening to reply speeches, is a, probably the point the judge is already assessing, right? Which of the teams is going to win this debate? Which of the teams is right? So what you do, as the judge is probably looking at the debate, looking at the content given, is he's expecting you to give him an extra map and to looking at, for instance, what he, the notes he's taken down, or perhaps not necessarily the notes, but simply the account from what has been perceived in the debate. And that is what is expected of the reply speech. And that's where the reply speech is so essentially uh, is so, so much essentially important because it has this role of re-clarification and reminding of what is important. Right. The next thing I would like to touch upon is what definitely and definitely the reply speech is not in consequence of what I've just said. The reply speech definitely is not the story of the debate, which is something I've often seen debaters do, probably by you know lack of something better to say from their perspective. They just recount the debate. They say, oh well, what happened in this debate is that the proposition said this, and the opposition said this, and then the proposition said this, and the opposition said this, and you know they were wrong, and this example was wrong, and this was wrong, and this was right. That's not something you're expecting as a judge, because that's exactly, like, that type of a speech is exactly the type of thing that is reading out my notes and drawing some conclusions about my notes. I don't want the reply speaker to do what I can already do. I don't want the reply speaker to tell me things that I already notice. And the story of the debate is something that if, you know, I'm at least paying attention as a judge, I will have already noticed. That's not what's missing. So that's something that you definitely shouldn't do because that's probably going to be boring to judge. Uh, the second thing that the reply speech is not is a chance to uh, indict the other team. Is a chance to uh, show how the other team has done a horrible job, you know, from a technical point of view, to tell to, to, to tell the judge, you know, these are the contradictions in their case. These are all their faulty uh, lines of argumentation. This is how they did this mistake and this mistake and this mistake. Right? So you don't want to do that. You're not, in the reply speech, you're not supposed to stand up and give, you know, destructive feedback or even constructive feedback to the other team. That's something that, again, 
will only annoy the judge and will not necessarily gain you any points within the debate. Because what the judge is looking for, essentially, is not for the reply speaker to do their job, right? So that's the main thing. Not, not telling the story, not giving feedback to the team. So the reply speech in itself has to uh, discuss, just like any other speech, it has to talk about the issue, not about the debate in a technical point of view. So you still have to address the issue. And that should be your only concern. So the point here is, you shouldn't rely, as a reply speaker, on trying to use uh, mistakes of others. You shouldn't rely on trying to recount what happened. What you have to do, and when I said, you know, you have to order things, or you have to create perspective, that doesn't mean you have to retell the story and tell it, you know, and put, it, put the story in order or something. What you have to do is a bit more complex. Oh, no, not complex, but subtle, let's say. It's a bit more subtle. What you have to do is to <coughs> realize, and that this is a work, this is like a mental exercise that you have to do during the debate, to realize what are the core clashes in this debate. What have we been discussing the most what has, been, what has been debated as the most important things? You may draw the conclusion that these things that were being discussed as the most important things are not the most important things. Or at least are not the most important things for your team. So, what, what should you do then? And this is actually the only question. What do you think you should do then? What do you do if before you know, standing up and giving, delivering your reply speech, you notice the most important clashes in the debate were not the most talked about, talked about clashes in the debate. Were not the ones that were given the most airtime. What do you do about that? What, what conclusions do you draw? Any ideas? Uh, well, look at it this way. The point is, right, we're, we're, we're supposed to be discussing the debate, but at the same time, there might be things that you have set up to prove from right, part of your burden that have not necessarily been touched upon. You might have been attacked on different issues, and you might have been attacked on issues that you feel, or your team feels, are secondary to you. Then what you want to do, even though <coughs> The, 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 the core issues you thought, you thought were important in the debate were not discussed as much as others. You still want to include them as major clashes, right? Why? Because you, what you want to include are not necessarily just the clashes that were there having their time in the debate, but those clashes that are simply put important within the debate. Now, there has to be a little specification. Obviously, if your team never mentions those things, then you probably don't have the right to include them in your reply speech. But had they been mentioned, and let's say not contentious, you can stand up in your reply speech and say, look, we, we had an argument about how, I don't know, this is fundamentally unjust, this has never been attacked, and let me tell you why this plays into, and why this sort of creates the background for which uh, the rest of the debate stands upon this fundamental argument. And that's a, good, that's a good move to make, because then you put into perspective the issue clashes. You show, on the broader scale, why you have uh, made of the best point for or against that point. So you have to look at these core issue clashes, right? Not just what happened in the debate, but what happened, but what, what the issue is fundamentally about. And what your case was fundamentally about. Again, the debate can be viewed from two, from two perspectives, right? There are two teams and therefore there will be two perspectives. So, you, have, you need to realize that you have, you have limited time. You only have four minutes. 
And you have to make it like matter. You have to make that that speech matter. You have to make that time matter. And what you, what you, what you have to do is to see not only which are the most important clashes within the debate, broadly speaking, or from the debate as a whole, but what are the most important clashes from Mantra's perspective? What do we want to prove? What do we think is important? And you have to structure them accordingly. It's not just, you know, a one, two, three step, like clash number one, clash number two, clash number three, and the top. There probably is some logic to that, right? There probably is some logic in the sense that this is the most important thing, and we've shown this, and this is how the world looks under our model or with our proposal. And then you move down the scale with your second option and say, but even if this wasn't true, this comes in, this function comes in. And then you can say, and they wanted to talk a lot about this thing, which we think is important. But anyhow, we think that even on this ground, we're taking the debate. Right? So, you, not necessarily that linking, not necessarily an even if, but there has to be, like, a put in, you have to put into perspective how the clashes you've identified work with each other, right? They're not just an enumeration of these are the clashes of the debate, but you have to show how these, how within this debate, these were the ideas that mattered. And how do these ideas influence themselves? Which of them is sufficient? What you're doing essentially, and maybe you've heard this about how what you have to do as a first speaker, especially as an opposition first speaker, you most of the times you have to stand up and you have to talk about the burdens of the two teams as well. You have to say, like, do we think that our burden is to prove this and this and this? And we think that their burden is to prove this and this and this. And you have to compare these burdens. This is something that's important at the end of the debate as well. You have to do that burdening. And within that burdening, it will become clear, or become much clearer, what you have to do in terms of flashes. You always have to come back to that burden. Because again, at this point, the judge is looking towards drawing conclusions about who did what in the debate. So what's really important for you is to put that as clear into perspective. So those flashes always have to look for this prism, right? The prism of who had to prove what, and did they do so? effectively or not. Alright. Questions at this point about everything that's been said. No? Alright. Moving forward. What you can do to make your reply speech better. There are a number of things that can work. In a reply speech, and there are a number of things that can't work in the reply speech, or that, that usually don't, not necessarily can. I'm not going to say something that can't ever work. Uh, right. There are so many perceptions about what, how reply speeches differ from normal constructive speeches. Like, the first thing to remember is that you cannot create new arguments in reply speeches. You're not supposed, you're not supposed to add analysis to start saying, oh look, now I'm going to explain how, what, what we really meant by this statement. Let me explain this statement to you. Let me, let me create some argumentation and give you some examples of that. That's something you should definitely shouldn't do in reply speeches. Simply because at the point of the reply speeches, the debate is technically already over, and you're just creating this, 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 this new perspective. So if you're going to do that, it's just going to be like, really, you should have done this earlier. Definitely you shouldn't do that. Other things you should include discussing very, very particular things. Because, again, the debate has been long. It has been long, it has contained a lot. If you focus on a particular thing, even if you think, like this particular thing was something that we didn't manage to win in the debate, and we should probably have given it more airtime and discussed this particular thing, you still shouldn't come up and say, like, now in the reply speech, let me say, I'll tell you a few more things about this particular thing. Let me tell you how this particular, in this very particular uh, example or clash area or very uh, particular situation, we want the debate. Why? Because that's usually not going to be what is crucial within that debate. It's not going to be what matters. Even if 
it was being discussed a lot in first in, in the first speeches, and let's say uh, the first speaker on the the first speaker on the other side, you know, managed to say something about it, and you didn't manage to respond. It's probably not going to matter as much. That's why I was telling you how the four minutes you have have need to be put into perspective, and they need to be put into value as much as possible. Because if you waste like forty seconds, one minute, on top discussing particular issues, then you're probably going to because it's so, like, time is so much more valuable there. You need to show that there are big, really important things you're discussing. If you, the, 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 the essential difference in perception that the judge has from constructive speeches to reply speeches is simply put that I want to feel, as a judge, that this speech is really important. This speech cannot discuss trivialities. Eight-minute speeches, you know, the constructive speeches, people go back and forth. I can expect a number of trivialities in these speeches. And I'm going to look past because there's a lot of comments there. But the reply speech really has to give this impression of, this is important from the beginning to the end. This is big stuff. This is relevant stuff. I'm not going to be listening to random uh, random chit chat, random accusations, random discussions on the topic. So that's a perception that's going to be strongly ingrained in what uh, what the judge has. So coming back to the to the issue of bringing in what what you can do to make your blind speeches better. So because you can't bring in new stuff, what you need to do is to rephrase or not rephrase. You what you have to do is to take ideas that were in the debate and put them in a new light, explain them better, simplify them usually. Right? When we discuss, when we say your first speaker has presented this awesome argument, but it wasn't developed enough. You've heard that probably in the past. You know, this argument wasn't developed. And this we expect from, us, let's say, the second speaker to come up and develop the argument, which means make it a bit more complicated, make it a bit more detailed, add a few layers to it. But in the reply speech, when you take an argument that was discussed, let's say, and develop in this matter, what you want to do is not make it more complicated, but make it more simple. You want to trim down all the complicated edges from the argument and make it a straight shoot. You know? Make it into something that is explicit enough, clear enough, and smart enough to reach the judge, to make that click in the judge's mind, uh-huh, okay, this is the relevance of this. This is the point of this. And this is the sort of thing that you need to do. This is how you can avoid excessive and tedious detail, excessive and tedious particularity in the reply speech. Any argument you feel you need to include there, or any idea that was said in the debate that you feel you need to include there, you have to take and you have to simplify. So it's always the question, how do I turn this one minute or 40 second idea into a 10 second, 5 second soundbite? That's probably going to be the challenge of your reply speech. So if you do that, you probably basically cannot fail in not becoming tedious with that sort of detail. Because if you're doing that, well, you're not going to have time to go into detail, like in, an, in any uh, annoying way. That's one thing. The second thing is, how is the reply speech supposed to be shaped? What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to simply start up talking and Divide it into subpoints and you know discuss each subpoint. Are you supposed to tell a story? Are you supposed to make a joke? Are you supposed to have any of these elements? <coughs> and these are common questions about uh, uh, about reply speeches. These are common things that I've seen happen again and again. I think that the, the answer to these points is yes. Any of these can be valid at a certain point. You can have a story, 
you can tell a story, but the question is, does that story really reveal what you want to say? You can start off your advice speech by making an analogy. You can start off your reply speech by making a joke. But if those things have to be relevant. Because if they're not relevant, if they're just something to amuse or just something to make the, the audience say, oh, that's a nice story, then you're wasting time in what your, what your objective is. Your objective has to be proving emotion. Your objective has to be deciding what the core issues are. So my, my, my personal suggestion is using, just using like good old, uh, good old division of, of, of what you want to say. And just divide your reply speech into points or questions, fundamental questions that will need to be answered, fundamental issues that, were, that need to be tackled, based on the burden you've identified for both of the teams. Either that, or you can use more complex things like, let me tell you a story that reflects on this, or reflects on this. But again, that has to be really pointful. And usually when you're telling, like when you're use gimmicks like, stylistic gimmicks like this, like telling a joke or a story, my suggestion is don't take up all of the time. Like take a maximum one minute with something like that. And it has to be really pointful again. So that's, that's, a, that's a very important uh, cautionary point, how to, um, how not to, to exaggerate that. All right. What the, the mindset that you have to be in, the mindset that you have to be in has to be a mindset of overview. There is a fundamental confusion, I think, that is uh, oftentimes made with what is the difference between first speakers and reply speakers. So I want to ask you, what do you feel is the difference between the first speakers and the first speakers? What's the role of first speakers as opposed to first speakers? Yeah? Uh, first speakers are more tries to add the extra analysis that was missing. It's a, this first speaker is actually probably one of the most, you know, hands-on, right there, in the moment, in the, the nitty-gritty of the debate type of speaker. That's what you have to, you have to, the, your, your attitude as a first speaker, the mindset you're in, is the type of mindset that, look, I'm right here, I just heard what happened in this debate, and I'm going to start adding more. I'm going to start, I'm going to add the finishing touches to my argumentation, I'm going to give the finishing blows to uh, the argumentation on the opposing side. So that's the sort of mindset you're in as a first speaker. But as a reply speaker, you, 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 you leave that mindset. You take the mindset of, okay, I'm taking a step back, I'm looking upon the rest of the debate as it occurs, and I'm thinking, how do I prove we want, essentially. So it's sort of, in that sense, making the case for what you did, for, for, what, for what your team did, what, what the performance of your team, after the fact. Making a case for why you think your team should have won. In a sense, a lot of people say, look, they're reply speakers, like an adjudication speech given from the perspective of your own team. Like, what if your own team was judging and they were a biased judge, obviously, and wanted to convince uh, the other team that uh, they had won? And in a way that's true. In a way that's true because what you're using, what you're essentially using is uh, stuff that's already happened. And you're looking from the, from the, the, the for, uh, you're looking at the debate from a far perspective. But why that's not true, and I come back to what I initially said, is because you shouldn't be critiquing the other team. Right? You're not supposed to come up in the reply speech and start talking about debate technicalities. You're not supposed to start assessing arguments and saying this was a weak argument, this was a strong argument, this was weak and this was strong, and we think because this is strong, it was never rebutted, therefore we won. Like, that's not the supposed to be the thing you're doing. You're supposed to discuss the actual issue, right? 
go into the actual issue. If you're debating about direct democracy at a local level, the reply speech has to be about direct democracy at a local level, not about arguments that were made. The point is, you, have, you shouldn't discuss what the performance of your team and the other team was. What you, have, what you need to discuss are the issues that your team brought up, the ideas that your team brought up, and that has to be your core content, right? So you're speaking from the perspective, the way you have to look still has to be from the perspective of a person that is passionate about that issue and wants to convince the audience that the motion is true or the motion isn't true, not that the team won or the team didn't win. That's what you have to ingrain into your audience, ingrain into your judge. That's, that attitude doesn't change from constructive speaker uh, to a reply speaker in any significant way. So is there no particular structure of a reply speech? Well, what I would tell you is that generally speaking, there is no particular structure for any speech. Like there's nothing, that, there's no structure that you would say you didn't have the structure, therefore you lose a lot of points or you lose the debate. There is logical structure that you should have. For instance, as a first speaker, there are things you need to do in order to have a good debate, like define the debate. Uh, explain what the context, what this, the status quo of the debate is, and probably provide a model if that's necessary, and have you know structured logical arguments. And in that sense, there is a structure to the reply speech, in the sense that the reply speech needs to touch upon the most important issues in the debate, and those most important issues, those most important ideas, those core clashes, if you. They have to come up, and you have to somehow make them evident. You may choose to make them evident through answering a number of questions. You may choose to make them evident by dividing them into three clashes, four clash areas. So there's no given structure. You have to figure out on your own for yourself what is the best type of structure. But structure in itself is important not because it respects one or another formality, one or another uh, fixed model of structure. It's important in the sense of the ideas that you present have to have a logical structure, have to, be, have, to have a logical order, right? They shouldn't be mixed around all, all over the place. The way you order them, the way you group them, the way you present them, that can be up to you. And it can make sense in, in a variety of ways. But the important thing is, you, have, you need to ask yourself the question, is the way I'm going to order my ideas going to make the judge understand what I'm trying to say? Or does the judge have to make an extra effort to make sense of everything that I've said? <coughs> and if the answer is, they're going to get it, they're going to understand, then I think that's fine. So, yeah. That's, that's how things are with structure. What structure would you prefer? Honestly speaking, I can tell you what structure I used to use when I was uh, debating world schools. Usually I would just divide the speech into points. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I, I was never big on you know, telling stories or doing any special gimmicks because I'm not exception, I wasn't exceptionally good at that. And I think, you know, I just, decided, ladies and gentlemen, I came up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the most important issue in this debate is this, and I'm going to talk about this and tell you why this still stands. The second issue, I, I just divided it into simple points. I think that's the, the easiest structure you can use. Just have three or maximum four points. Um, so, when you're kind of, should you just not mention the other side's like if you can somehow prove yourself by kind of mentioning them, could you come at that in or she's not? Without mentioning them at all. Yeah. Well, like if you need to say like they said this, what kind of be like? Okay. Could you just not mention? I think them? I think you get it. Well, it's, I don't think it's like oh my god, you mentioned them. This is awful. Uh, but 
the important thing is mentioning their ideas. I think you could, the way you can phrase it, like you can phrase it like this. You don't, you don't need to say, they said this, and we say this. You can just say, on the issue of representation, we've heard, we, we've, we've, we've come up with the notion that representation isn't sufficient, that power needs to be direct. We've been given a number of, uh, let's say, examples on how representation can be improved, on how uh, representation can be made more direct. But, so you don't need to refer to they said, you can just discuss the issue, say we've been faced with this idea, now the way we respond to this idea, and it will be obvious to the judge that you're referring to their idea, because it makes sense in the context. If, if that was that was your question? Yeah. Other stuff? Okay. The I think that when looking at um, your duty as your advice speaker, there's also a question of how you prepare. How do you even prepare for this for this task? Do you just uh, find inspiration and you know write a few things down? and then come up with uh, a funky reply speech. I think you need to have like the, the, the core the core elements of the debate have to be something that you've been discussing in your team preparation right, before the debate is started. So that's the first glimpse at what you want your reply speech to be about. The point is, throughout the whole debate you should be thinking about your team strategy. You should be thinking about What's the end of here? You've started off saying what your burden is, what the burden of the other team is. And by saying this, what you do is, if I, well, you say this because what you want to do is have the control over what is being done in the debate. You, need, you want to be in control of the issues that are being discussed. And with these objectives in mind, that's what you do in the robot speech as well. You keep these objectives in mind and you come back to the core things that you wanted to make important, right? It's very important for you as a reply speaker to be there with your team. If you're going to come up with like really, really important issues around the motion, <coughs> but those really, really important issues around the motion are going to be fun significantly aside from what your teammates and even yourself as a constructive speaker, half put on the table, then you're not doing a good job, right? Because then you're, what you're doing is you're sort of showing through your reply speech that, well, I, had to, I have some better ideas about the debate than my team had. And that doesn't put them in a good light. And it also doesn't enforce their win uh, in that situation. So that's why when preparing for your reply speech, you need to compare two things. There are two things that always need to be in your mind. What's our, what was our initial plan? What did we set out to do in this debate? How do I include this in the reply speech? And secondly, what's happening in this debate right now? What's been going on throughout the debate? What has the other team been saying? How has the debate been evolving? How have the clashes throughout the speech has been evolving? And these two need to be taken into consideration, right? So you can't ignore things. Because I've told you earlier, I told you earlier that you need to look not only at the clashes that had the most airtime in the debate, but those that are most important to the issue, even if they didn't have so much airtime. However, you still need to pay attention as not to ignore things that were important in this debate. You need to have an answer to why you're going to give something more important even though it didn't seem as discussed. So, in the reply speech, you will, be <coughs> you will be giving priority. You'll be saying, this is the most important. This is the crux of the debate. And you need to say why. You can't just come up and say, this is the crux of the debate. You have to tell, tell the judge why. You have to tell the judge why you think that this issue, even though it wasn't the most discussed one, is the most important one. So you need to somehow go through what has been discussed. 
if you're going to deem some of the stuff that's been discussed as relevant <coughs> or as less le relevant, you need to say, look, I'm going to show you why all of this, all of the, these bits that were constantly discussed back and forth really just come back to this. So you need to make that effort. You need to show why this, uh, why this, your most main, uh, your most important idea is crucial. So, a few things, uh, a few things to remember. Look, look for clash. Two. Look for issues, even if they weren't necessarily a uh, major clash. Free. Um, don't ignore. Four. No detail. Is to 
make those ideas that you are going to discuss, make them abundantly clear. Emphasize them. Use your voice to put, to put emphasis on them. Use your talent. Use your body language to, to show why things are important, why things are, let's say, crucial to the debate, or why things sum up the debate in uh, the best way possible. All right. Any extra questions? No? Sure. All right then. Uh, thank, thank you for listening. Huh? Yeah. So, what's the best way how to, to, make, how to make notes during the debate? Is it possible? I think that I think that, that depends on the way you take notes, because so so many people take notes in so many different ways. Uh, I think there there are this is sort of going into the note taking techniques that that exist, but there are a number of models. Probably, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the the flowing technique, right? Here we have six columns. And you write down what each speaker says, and then you draw some lines, like this is a response to this. And I think this is a pretty good model. Like you can go on through, you go throughout the debate until the third speech. And I think this is a pretty good model to realize what has been discussed most in the debate, right? To realize what the clashes have been in the debate, and then you can compare that to what you've written down as we think this is these are the main burdens of the debate, and compare them. Do they fit? So I think this can be a very good model uh, to apply as a reply speaker. I think probably this is more useful for reply speakers than it would be useful for uh, constructive speakers, speakers as such, because constructive speakers don't necessarily uh, look at the big picture as much as they look at the detailed picture, so they probably have to concentrate more on detail. But this is a very good big picture schematic. You know, response, constructive, Response, constructive, response, constructive. So there you have, you know, everything that's been discussed. It's a map right in front of you. But again, like if someone else has a different model they're comfortable with, I'm not going to say that this is the right way. It just probably is one of the good ones. Other other questions, issues, or maybe perhaps other stuff that you found that you have found unclear about reply speeches in the past, and I really haven't covered. And if other difficulties or anything like that. Um, what is the best way to finish your own speech? Mm, probably by not being over time, okay. which is a lot of people do. <laughs> not by not being under time. Uh, you shouldn't finish abruptly, or you shouldn't. You sh it shouldn't. It shouldn't seem like you know your 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 speech was just cut at some point. The best way to finish is probably to draw some conclusion, to come back to your most important point. You, your first point probably was the most important point. And then maybe at the last 20 seconds you want to come back and say, and look, at the end of the day, this debate was about this. I've shown you in this and this, by this and this and this, that the debate was about this. We own this point, therefore, or something like that. A small conclusion that brings the judge back to this was the most important. This is what we talked about. I reminded you of it, so good for us. Something like this. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for listening.